May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Easter 7. We are coming to the close of the most festive 50 days of the church year. And though it has all been virtual, we have been decked out in our best white vestments, reclaimed the word Alleluia, and you have joined me, I assume, in enthusiastically proclaiming that same Alleluia at the dismissal. My children have warned their spouses and others that I really like that part, and they are right, I do. After all, apart from a baptism, we won't hear those words at the dismissal until April 17th, 2022, next Easter. We are coming to the end of the greatest party that the church puts on. We have heard familiar lessons from John that tell us of disciples that we find we can relate to. There was a new normal for them to adjust to. Things were not the way they had been before. This was change, but they soon came to realize that this was going to be all right. Grief-stricken, afraid, doubtful, and hiding behind locked doors, we hear how they are met by the risen Christ in those locked upper rooms and on lonely roads and given by grace everything that they needed not only to believe, but to go forth into the world and to bear the gospel to the ends of the earth. And they believed, and so do we. And great celebration continues. Last Thursday, the church celebrated the ascension of our Lord. Things changed again for the disciples, and this time, this time, the change was more profound. This time, they witnessed Jesus ascending to the Father, and this time, they knew that any sort of presence that they could see or witness in the person of Jesus, however it was, in their lives, was gone forever. The lesson from Acts for that day speaks of them witnessing what that what had to be, I don't know, all at once a glorious and yet terrifying event as Jesus is lifted up in a cloud and out of their sight. Excuse me. And they stand there gazing upward, fulfilled with some of the same familiar emotions of grief and fear as they receive a message of the foreshadowing of what is to come. And because they are the disciples that we can all relate to, they don't understand. Instead, what they do, what most of us would do, they return to the familiar, to that locked upper room. Their greatest task was still ahead of them, and they were not yet prepared in their hearts for the work they will be given to do. Jesus knew that. Jesus understood, and so that the prayer Jesus prays and the one we find in today's gospel is one with that great love for them, asks the Father to care and protect these that remain in the world. This is a long prayer. It is most of the chapter of seven, chapter 17, and to be honest, it is so important that we hear it in sections in each lectionary. Last year, year A, we heard the beginning of the prayer. Today, we hear the middle. Next year, we will hear its end. It is that important. The things that lie ahead will not always be easy. In fact, they were often dangerous. But Jesus, in his prayer, assures the Father that they have been given what they need to believe, and that they do believe, and that they are now the Father's. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given to me, so that they may be one as we are one. Their task was to be great, something the likes of the world had never seen, and Jesus knew that in spite of the differences that brought them together in their gathering, that through his teaching and his guidance, the disciples now believed that Jesus was sent by the Father and were therefore equipped to carry on in Jesus' name. The disciples were at a time of huge transition, from being followers to leaders, from being students to teachers. No wonder Jesus prayed with so much love and fervor for those he was preparing to leave. Transition. 
what a time of transition and confusion we have faced these past 14 months. And while it might be presumptuous to think these events have had quite the same impact as the transition that faced the disciples, honestly, it still brings about some of the same emotions in all of us. We too have felt confusion and grief that comes with loss, anxiety that comes with the unknown and untested future. How will or will we ever be able to be church again? When will things return to normal or worse, what will the new normal be? Is this the time and if not now, then when will there be time for justice for all our sisters and brothers? Is now the time we finally seek to slow climate change? When will we seek to find common ground rather than so easily seeking and finding a way to create diversion, division? So many questions, so much fear, so much honest apprehension. And yet here today, when we seem to need it the most is this gospel passage. Here is Jesus' prayer that offers all the assurance and the certainty that we are seeking. A prayer that is grounded in Jesus' love for us. Our presiding Bishop Michael Curry would offer that through the thicket of questions and fears, what we need to do is to walk in the way of that love. If we walk in that way of love, poverty would become history. Saving the earth, slowing climate change, when we walk in the way of that love, the earth, he says, will become a sanctuary. Peace, especially in the Middle East, when love is the way, we lay our swords and shields down by the riverside to study war no more. Justice for all, Curry writes, when love is the way, there is plenty of room for all of God's children. Linda Clater, in her commentary, tells us that ancient theologians who talked about these verses actually suggested that what was meant by Jesus' oneness with the Father does not suggest, it does suggest movement, although not a walk. She offers the image of a dance, if you will, among the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So perhaps then the call we hear in this passage includes our ability to join wherever we find ourselves in a glorious, joyful, and common dance of faith. I like this image, one of a dance with many dancers, all celebrating the ability to come together and create holy movement, while at the same time embracing our diversity and our variety of all our gifts and talents. Next Sunday, Pentecost will mark the transition from the disciples cloistered in that upper room to the beginning of the church's dance of holy choreo choreography. Now as the disciples, apostles, begin to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. It is a dance that has seen the addition of new patterns and steps over centuries. It is a dance that once it started has never ceased. We dance together despite our differences or perhaps because of our differences. But most importantly, the thing is we are dancing. We are dancing trusting in the certainty and the assurance of the prayer in today's gospel. The prayer that Jesus prayed for the community he once loved and left and for those who now that he has joined with the Father and the Spirit, he loves and cares for without ceasing. The great 50 days are coming to a close. The Alleluia dismissal will be tucked away, and we will enter a time that some liturgical calendars refer to as ordinary time. And yet, we dance. We dance as we move through the anxiety and stress of transition toward what will become our new normal. But most of all, we dance because we are forever encircled and held by the love of Christ. <laughs>